Can I just say, first of all, that I feel like such a tech genius, just looking on like three different tabs right now and two screens. It's so, there's so much going on. But anyway, let's just let's just start then. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Toby and I am the student union president at the University of Birmingham. And I'd like to say a big thank you for coming and welcome to our decolonization in practice conference. It's it's definitely very, very heartening to see so much interest, both from the University of Birmingham and of course the wider student movement in our conference. And I just like to start by thanking um, the National Union of Students for the help and support in planning um, and promoting the sessions and just being super generous with their time. Thank you very much. Um, now, this conference um, aims to just do one thing and that is to provide all of us with the understanding and tools to decolonize the curriculum and our institutions. And, you know, it's about moving away from discussions that are theoretical, but into like the more practical business of actually getting things done. Um, and in order to do that, we have an incredible lineup of colleagues from the CERT movement, um, academia and beyond, you know, just providing us with case studies, skills and insights for uh, the next two days. Um, we know that this work obviously is, is very vital to tackling the injustices that um, plague higher education today. Uh, take for instance, the uh, attainment gap between black and white students, which is still far too high. And far too many students tell us that they, they don't see people like them being reflected in their curriculum or their institution. And I think more fundamentally, however, is that the legacy of colonialism is still alive and well across higher education and in, in how virtually every subject is taught and conceptualized. Um, and, and, and we believe that if students are, you know, to truly understand their field of study, then this definitely has to change. And it's, it's very clear that the government and the Office for Students are not going to do what is needed here. So to put it simply, it is up to us. And, you know, this is why this conference was very, very important to us. And, and because we believe that only by educating and supporting um, a network of activists can we truly face this challenge. But that is enough for me. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Larissa Kennedy. Um, Larissa is uh, the former president of Warwick um, Student Union and a trustee of the British Youth Council. Um, she's now the incredible president of the NUS. Um, in all the roles she's held, she's been a champion for all students and has been doing a truly stunning job um, holding the government to account and being a voice for students throughout the pandemic. So please join me in a virtual round of applause for our, our first speaker, uh, Larissa Kennedy. Thank you so, so much, Toby. I'm really, really excited to be here and, and, and to be, you know, supporting on this conference because it's true, you know, we've come so far in the conversation about decolonization and really uprooting racism. And now we have the opportunity to talk about what that looks like in practice and how we drive that forward um, as a movement. Um, and, you know, if we were in person right now, usually I would probably shout across that. We'd, we'd inevitably be in some like poorly lit lecture theater or something. Um, at, uh, you know 10 a.m on a Wednesday morning and I would usually like get people um, you know excited about this and ask you what three words come to mind when I see decolonization so you know I'm still going to try and do that do a little bit of uh, virtual interactivity so feel free um, to jump in the chat and let us know for you what are the three words that come to mind when we talk about decolonization because it's really great to get an idea of where people's heads are at when I say that um, and often to see the kind of threads of similarity between what people's experiences of decolonization and what it means to them are um, up to this point so don't be shy um, jump in the chat let us know give us your three words or if you can just think of one chuck one in if you think of more I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you no um, but yeah it'd be good to hear from you um, and, and let me know what your three words are and then I'll kind of start to share um, the beginnings of a definition for me or for us at NUS. Um, so yeah, just want to start off with that. But thank you so much for having me. You're welcome, Larissa. And Toby, um, do you do still want to do the slide? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'll okay. put them up in a sec. It's just because when I put the slides up, I can't see the chat. But if you want to share um, words that come to mind for you, Toby, as well, do let us know um, when we say decolonization, like 
what does it make you think of like what immediately comes to mind um it's just nice to hear from people otherwise I'm just talking to a screen once I put my slides up um but yeah if not we'll let that kind of come through oh reclamation I love that I'm probably going to get into that a little bit in the in the kind of presentation justice anti-hierarchical freedom oh those are beautiful especially anti-hierarchical you know um I think it's, it's talking when we're talking about it in practice like how do we actually live and breathe that it's going to be so interesting colonial matrix of power yeah um straight I don't know if you meant that in terms of like cis heteronormative but yes absolutely um and I think looking at you know looking at how we decolonize gender and our understandings of gender and sexuality and all of those things are so so interesting um these are already I'm like everyone in everyone who's in this space is on fire already redistribution unlearning yeah I think there's this really interesting dichotomy that I hope we get to speak a little bit about around unlearning and learning or right, I continue to put them in the chat I'm gonna jump into the presentation but it's just really really interesting to see where people are at um at so far so let me just start to share my screen and get into it so if I can figure out how to work my own laptop. You know, the way that I begin to try and define decolonization is around actively striving to grasp at the roots of structural oppression in our education system and to radically reimagine the systems and structures of our institutions through an anti-racist and anti-oppressive lens. And of course, you know, I cheated a little bit. I asked you folks for three words and um, did way more than three words myself. But what I can do is start to break that down into three pillars um, that I see is really crucial to this conversation. Um, because, you know, when I say all of the systems and structures of our institutions, um, that's because we often talk about decolonizing curricula. And of course, that's really crucial, you know, decolonization from the perspective that universities are sites of knowledge production, knowledge sharing, spaces of learning, teaching and assessment. But I think there's also the university as a site of community um, and decolonizing the manifestation of racism between the ways that students, workers, both academic and non-academic, and then, you know, within this marketized framework, an inherently problematic management structure all function um, in reproducing racism. Um, and then, of course, there's kind of the university in relation to everything else, like how do we decolonize the economic, social, political impacts of the university on the surrounding community and the wider world? So I think let's, if we take the kind of first of those pillars um, that I described, um, you know, sites of knowledge, knowledge production, I'd say that knowledge, decolonization is about challenging what is recognized legitimized and by extension delegitimized as knowledge and or as forms of knowledge production and so I think the point that was made in the chat about unlearning is a really important one um, because it's really about stripping back what we've been taught to legitimize and delegitimize which of course is kind of inherently interlinked with what is researched uh, and what is then taught um, but equally the way that it's taught and assessed um, and I think one of the really interesting um, parts of this area of thought um, for me is around decolonizing pedagogy um, and things like decentering authority surrounding knowledge and who holds it uh, and really challenging um, how pedagogy feeds in to the racist structures of our institutions. And then, of course, we need to do this across different disciplines uh, and in interdisciplinary work, because I think there's often this misconception that only certain disciplines need to be decolonized. But of course, it's the institutions as a whole. Um, so then that kind of second pillar around racism uh, as part of the university community and how that's kind of embedded um, into the university community. And this is the kind of uh, definition I began to give before. Um, and I put on the slide the chant that if you've been to a protest um, as a student, you may have heard many a time, I know I have, whose university, our university. Um, because, you know, this really is a question of who is at this institution, who does the institution belong to? Uh, and I think once you start on this pillar, you begin to ask questions like, what's the experiential reality of people of colour at the institution? What is and isn't considered acceptable within that institution? If you report racism, what policies are there to recognise what you're experiencing? Who do these policies protect? And who's deciding this? Um, and I think 
think those are all really important to think about um, because of course interpersonal racism continues to be um, an issue um, and the kind of result of the ways that institutional racism legitimizes um, racism in our day-to-day -day experiences as students of color, as black students. Which I think also leads into the question of demography, like who has access to that institution and why, and who holds power to shape these institutions. Um, and within the kind of um, incredibly flawed, corporatized, centralized management of universities within the marketized framework, it also calls into question who holds the power to shape these institutions and how do we decolonize and democratize the very running of them. And kind of then, so this, yeah, that's the kind of community pillar um, that I often speak to when talking about decolonization. Um, and then looking to the last of those sections, you know, I spoke about like what's beyond, like how does the university function in relation to everything else? Um, and I, you know, I really think we need to do more to connect all of those conversations to how we decolonize the university as a wider actor within society, particularly critiquing the economic relationships that universities foster. Um, and thinking about how we action tangible community solidarity, because I think, you know, as, as a movement, we need to redress the fact that universities often take a very isolationist approach to their locality. Um, and this can often reproduce a, a kind of colonial legacy, um, particularly where you have co like white majority institutions um, in the middle of or adjacent to black and brown communities uh, and the impacts that that often has. Um, but also, um, as well as community solidarity and, and looking at the locality, um, on the flip side, or kind of as an extension of that, thinking about what tangible international solidarity looks like as well, and how can we hold universities complicit in the ways that they are impacting people of colour in the global south predominantly as well. Um, because, you know, there's often complicity in war, in the climate crisis, which is obviously having a direct impact here and now, particularly on people of colour in the global south. Um, and I think there's so much more um, to, to kind of delve into with that conversation um, that we, we might not have time for in, in this session here, but I'm really excited about unpacking. Um, as we see more and more organizing throughout the student movement for decolonial divestment. So I guess that kind of is my, in my cheap way of saying my three words around knowledge, community and beyond. Um, and I hope that kind of gives people a bit of a, um, a taste of how, how I like to conceptualize decolonizing universities um, and decolonizing education institutions. But of course, um, the, the conference is about decolonization in practice and now that we've done the kind of precursor to it I'm excited to get into that a little bit more because Poka Le Nui speaks about the five stages of decolonization the first being rediscovery and recovery and I think when, when I first heard this I was I had to take a step back and be like whoa because what this is really talking about is starting to or beginning to even try to conceptualize how much has been lost, how much we don't even know that we don't know because of colonization uh, and how much there is yet to rediscover and recover from those lost histories, from those lost stories. Um, and you know, that it's just, it's, it's beyond even our wildest dreams. I don't think we can even um, fathom how much we have lost, how much um, if there is yet to rediscover and recover. The second stage of this is around mourning and, you know, recognizing that when you're trying to come to terms with how much has been lost, how much has been um, taken from us, it does lead to a stage of mourning. It does need um, to be processed adequately uh, and we need to create the space for that. I mean, often, you know, because of the, the types of institutions that we're trying to navigate within, we're doing this work and there's a deadline or there's a, a set timeline or whatever. And are we creating the space to actually reflect and mourn um, what we have lost um, and what we're then trying to rediscover and recover? Um, the third part of this, the third kind of section of this is my absolute favorite. Everyone who follows me on Twitter, anyone who knows me knows I talk about dreaming a lot. Um, because I think it's one of the most intentional things that we can do um, in, you know, furthering the movement for decolonization is continuing to dream. Um, 
and creating this space for dreaming. Uh, and I don't think we do that enough. Um, and, and, you know, often it's not something that can have a KPI or that you can put, like, it can't be truncated. You need to just create space for joy, for, um, for rest. And, and that's where dreaming is often able to thrive. Um, and so I think also if you get the time this, this week, take the time to, to have a think about how you can make that um, step towards dreaming and really regularizing dreaming, which I'll talk a bit about in a second. Um, and then the fourth stage is around commitment. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk about this in a bit as well, because I think what we are really well placed to do as a student movement is drum up um, an understanding of what decolonization is so that people can make a tangible commitment um, to this movement. And then of course the fifth section and the fifth stage is around action and really taking like, you know, um, to find action to further this movement. So let's, as I say, let's get into the, a couple of those a bit more because I think there is some particular areas where the student movement can, and I hope will make some headway over the next couple of years. Um, because this, this really, for me, this, this part around commitment is about movement building. It's about how do we empower people at the grassroots to have the, the resources and the tools that they need um, to really be drumming up commitments. Um, and that, that doesn't have to be in the most kind of like, everyone needs, like, I need people to say or state or whatever that they are, pro decolonization I, I need that kind of um quite literal I, I'm also mean that how are we creating the spaces for people to come to this commitment particularly um for for people of color and and that's why I love the kind of um the word in the chat at the beginning about being anti-hierarchical because I think this commitment shouldn't be like okay I'm I'm leading decol um and I want these people to come on a journey with me it's about everyone having the space um to to find commitment within themselves through through spaces of learning through spaces um that provide the opportunity for people to come to that commitment um and I think fundamentally if we want to make that sustainable and we want to make that continue on that's about building organizing spaces um, and these often are able to regularize the moment of dreaming so that people then come to that commitment. Um, and I think that is so, so important. Um, and I know that allyship is quite controversial, um, but in the institutions we're at, particularly at, you know, quite um, heavily white institutions, I think there is also a role um, for, for drumming up the commitment of allies. Um, and of course, holding them to account in that uh, and recognizing that allyship is a verb rather than like a, a noun, a label that you can attach to oneself. Um, but yeah, really, um, how can we build commitment um, for this work? And then action. Um, and, you know, there, there's way too much to cover on this in, in one slide. So I'm going to get into that in a bit more detail. But the things that I'm hoping to cover around action, I think there's a huge um, sentiment within the student movement that we need to connect the conversations around divestment, disarmament and decolonization. Um, there's the role of, you know, what what does, um, you know, once we're talking about divestment, what does radical, what does, um, you know, meaningful investment in people of color look like? Um, and then some work around transformation. So let's get into that because there is, you know, the role of the decolonizing movement in railing against universities' complicity in things like the arms trade, the immediate impacts of the climate crisis in the global south, but also quite directly the, the erasure and invisibilization of scholarship um, from both people of color here, but also people of color in the global south as well. Um, so I think this is really, really important to be connecting um, these conversations and, and when we're doing um, organizing work around this to do it in the most holistic sense. Then, you know, what, do, what does investment actually look like? I think it's literally the flip side of all of that. So how do we make sure that universities are moving beyond empty platitudes? Because particularly in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw universities coming out saying Black Lives Matter, some of them even struggled to say the word Black, uh, and that is the, the kind of dire state that we're in right now. Um, so how do we move beyond those empty platitudes, those Black squares that they were putting up, um, and actually put their resourcing behind 
um, supporting the, the work of students, not only within the academy, but also beyond it. And I'm going to talk a bit later about how we do work beyond the academy, because, of course, there are limitations um, to the work that we can do within it. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, what does it mean to invest for change? Um, and I'm really excited that there's um, kind of uh, NUS is working with Students Organising for Sustainability UK um, around what investing for change looks like. Um, because, you know, we're telling universities to divest, but they have all of this resource. Um, of course, we're, we're in a difficult contest now, but let's not forget universities have a lot of resource um, and can make tangible difference. Um, and students can really drive that difference. Uh, and then of course, um, there's the role in, you know, funding and supporting research and scholarship um, of people doing the work um, around decolonization. So I wanted to talk a bit about what the movement in the UK is looking like, because, you know, we've got this like really problematic customer framework, as I was saying at the beginning, um, that really wants students to be this kind of passive receiver of education. And of course, once we're talking about decolonization, we're really flipping that on its head because we're seeing students as actors in shaping what their, their education should and could be. Um, and apologies, it seems to be an, an old version of the slides. Um, but really, I think what I wanted to say there is, is around how we then connect the work that we're doing here in the UK um, to the work happening globally. Because, um, and I want to talk a in a second about the global um, decolonized movement, because of course we are standing on the shoulders of giants um, and must recognize where the kind of the, the, the kind of inklings of this and the beginnings of this were and of course um, that was predominantly in in the global south so this is why that kind of leads me to speak about internationalism within that movement because as i say the histories of this movement come from the, the kind of roads must fall work um, and that organizing movement in cape town which of course led um, to Rose Ross Fall in Oxford, um, which really drove forward um, the Why Is My Curriculum White work that happened in Leeds and other places around the UK. Um, and this, 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 the way that this global movement is inherently interconnected, it kind of means that when we're picking up the baton of this work, um, it's kind of incumbent upon us to continue those threads of internationalism and, and make sure that, in, that, yes, we have threads of international solidarity in our work, but also um, that we are continuing those conversations in terms of how we continue to do this work um, and what it looks like um, and what it feels like. Um, and I think that's really, really powerful. And so, you know, I've been in this role about, I think, 16 weeks now, and we've already had the opportunity um, to speak to um, organisers who represent the kind of All Africa Students Union, um, the Namibian and Ghanaian Students Unions, um, about reimagining universities through an anti-colonial lens. And I think the only way to do that um, in, in a kind of authentic way is to constantly be in conversation with those um, those doing that work in, in the global south, um, and then also wanted to mention that this this you know this learning process um, is one that I feel very um, I, that I, I'm continuing to be on, but feel very privileged to have um, accessed, and so uh, trying to share that learning where we can. And so um, so far, we've also started to train up um, student officers in Denmark. And who were interested in really begin, having the beginnings of that conversation um, in Denmark as well, because they're just not at the stage that we're at in the UK. So, as I said, I wanted to get into a little bit of the limitations of decolonizing the academy, because I'm really, really, really excited about the NUS Decolonize Network and how we're going to be supporting um, using this campaign to support local action and local activism around um, decolonization and of course there are absolutely waves we can make don't get it twisted like i'm talking about limitations but there are absolutely ways we can make um, in building sustainable organizing communities um, for folks to really be uprooting the ways that our universities are built on historical genocide enslavement displacement and all of that um, and i think you know as students we are so well placed um, to be driving forward that conversation but for a second, I want us to think about like what are the limitations and how do we kind of usurp those? So 
You know, I saw a really interesting tweet the other day um, that said the only way university organizing will ever truly enact meaningful and permanent change is the day we abolish universities as we know them. And I just want to dwell on that a second because, you know, I think there is so much uh, that we can do, as I was saying, to drive forward this movement. But at the end of the day, we've already seen how how much institutions have attempted to dilute and co-opt this conversation. Because conversations about decolonization, as I was saying, were being had from when, you know, the Roads Must Fall movement was um, really, really taken off. Um, and we saw when we were having conversations about the black attainment gap, it got reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced until we were literally talking about, oh, black people need mentors and that's gonna solve everything. Um, and it became this very, um, truncated, um, reductive conversation that was putting the onus on black students, you know, to level up or whatever people wanted to frame it as without um, making a, a tangible commitment to actually uprooting the ways that racism manifests within these institutions, the fact that they are a very product of colonialism and that just was not being, um, that wasn't being wrestled with in a, a real way. Um, and, you know, recognizing that it's not in the interests of these institutions themselves to do that work, like, because it makes, it makes us question, you know, who's managing these universities and why are they getting so much for it? And, and why do we have this management structure that is so hierarchical and all of these things that like once we're questioning all of these things, it's not in the interests of these institutions to do that work. And so we can never fully trust these institutions to do it themselves. It has to be a grassroots led movement. And so I thought this idea about abolition of universities as we know them was so interesting because we also see a lot of the ways that university function relies on many forms of elitism, which of course is never going to be compatible with anti-racism. Um, and so I think it's really exciting that we could be really thinking anew about what a decolonized, what an anti-racist, what a truly pro-black liberation space of teaching and learning looks like. Um, and, you know, we, we see universities as the space for knowledge production, but actually universities, we know them are just a, a construction of what a space of knowledge and learning could look like. Uh, and we have the liberty to really build in, in our minds through dreaming, as I was going back to, I love, I love through dreaming, through dreaming to build what we see um, as those anti-racist spaces of knowledge production. And then I put this meme on the screen because I was like, this really sums it up to be quite honest. Because if we look at, you know, the, the solutions that have been put forward to anti-racism, we've been talking about how we uproot race and how we talk about um, these fundamental ways that it's sewn into the fabric of our institution. Um, and, and these, they've just been looking away. They said, mm, I'm not sure. You know, we're constantly seeing institutions pretend to commit to anti-racism and actually just kind of stall um, and delay that work actually happening. Um, meanwhile, students continue to push back and see it on a typical basis as well, because they know that, you know, students come in, for the most part, they're there for three, four, um, you know, kind of years, and they continue to like act brand new and act as though these conversations haven't been had. Um, and they do that purposely because the liberal anti-racist work is much more palatable um, and digestible for the institution because it requires only surface level change as opposed to grasping at the roots um, of ways that racism is manifesting. So that meme really speaks to me, it really speaks to my experience trying to do radical anti-racist work. Um, and just as a reminder that decision makers and the institutions as we know them today aren't going to be coming to us wanting us to do this work it's about us creating spaces to do this work um, outside of their framework which i guess leads me back to the conversation about organizing beyond our institutions and you know i'm really overjoyed that um in in many ways um i i get to do a lot of this work within nus but also outside of my role at nus i, I make up a small part of the team at the free black university and um, FBU is a hub um, for radical and transformative knowledge production. Um, you know, as I was just saying, we've seen the fight for decolonization going on for years and years and years. Um, and it's actually the recognition that 
you know, the current education system, universities as we know them, are limited in what they can offer us. They are limited in how much we can really do. So how can we build um, spaces of knowledge production that built, are built by and for Black people? Um, and I know that Ty from the FBU team is going to be speaking at the conference um, later in the kind of conference. So I'm really, really excited to hear from Ty um, because this is about kind of an Afrofuturist perspective that really centers black healing, um, but also, you know, what does it mean um, to, to, to build a space um, from the perspective of black liberation as opposed to trying to tack it on um, once these institutions are already, in some cases, decades old, some of them even more, um, and have already sown racism into their very being. Um, so I think building spaces beyond our institutions is so, so important too. So I, I guess the, the last thing for me to say is that this is about people getting involved. There's, there's no hierarchies, there's no, you need to know all of this before you jump in. None of it, I think, as I was saying, a commitment to dreaming, a commitment to action is all that you need. Um, this is about a constant learning process for all of us. Um, and I'm just so, so excited um, to see the student movement take that on and create those spaces for people um, to continue to do that. So I think one of the things that we've been saying to people is help shape the campaign. If you feel like um, you really wanna get involved with this, you know, the NUSD Colonized Education Campaign over the next two years is really gonna be building that grassroots support um, for students to be really taking this on, really, really taking this on because it's not about, you know, you know, any, any one person or any group of people leading. This is about collectively making sure um, that our national union is serving the interests uh, of grassroots organizers. Um, and you don't have to be a grassroots organizer TM um, to, to get involved. Like it, it's, all that means is that you have a commitment to doing this work and um, you want a space to do it. So please jump in. Like if you're a student, if um, you're an officer, whatever you're up to, um, let us know. You can find it on the NUS Connect website, how to get involved. Um, because I think we've termed it critical friends that we're looking for. We really want this to, this campaign to serve what you need it to um, in terms of providing tools and resources. Um, so do get involved and help shape the campaign. We've also got some resources um, that have been created throughout Black History Month because we just launched a campaign um, at the beginning of October. Um, and, you know, there, there's a podcast around. Um, we did an Insta Live answering some questions around this. Um, and of course, the rest of the conference is going to be an incredible space um, to continue this conversation and keep um, all of us collectively getting to grips with how we move forward with this in a really tangible way. Um, and, you know, if that throws up more questions um, than we have time for today or then we have the space for today, um, then feel free to reach out to me via email, via social media, um, because as I say, like, I'm still learning. Um, our team, I think, has a commitment to continual learning um, as a form of, you know, decolonization. I think that's so, so important. Um, so, yeah, if, if you think there's stuff I've missed or there's more stuff you would add, because, um, you know, I, I get the joy of delivering things like this for, for students across the country all the time. So I'm always open to hearing your thoughts um, about, you know, what, what we've been talking about here today, but also, you know, if we don't have the space, if you don't want to ask a question here, then feel free to drop me a line. Um, but yeah, I'm what I'm going to do now is bring down the presentation and just get into it. If anyone has any comments, questions, feelings, thoughts, um, wants to get involved, let me know. And just thank you so, so much for listening. And yeah, with, our movement is so powerful, like seriously, so, so powerful. And um, when we collectively come together um, and organize at the grassroots, and I'm just so excited to see what we do over the next few years and so grateful um, to the Guild for really putting this on and making this happen because this is so exciting. Like once we get into it, they, they can't stop us. It's, it's by force of our fire. We're going to make sure that we leave, we pass on the baton to the next generation of students who are going to continue this work and that this work lives beyond us. And that's that's what we're building. So I'm very, very excited. I'm going to stop sharing screens so I can see people's um, questions, comments, anything. But yeah, again, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Larissa. I think that was very, very thorough. Um, if, if I came into this um, conversation having no knowledge of decolonization, I think that was a very, very good start and very, very 
oh my goodness, I don't know what was that. Um, but you know, it was it was really really insightful. Thank you. And and I think just just as as some points of reflection, just based on what you said, um, decolonization is is a learning process. Um, it's more than just the curriculum. Um, it's a global conversation, and by no means an easy task um, driving forward the movement. And like you said, these the, these conversations have been, you know, somewhat diluted by universities. And you can see that where you know instead of decolonizing the curriculum, for instance, is more focus on diversifying it and not really paying attention to like the root causes or like you know other things in between which are like two different things um and and we we did have a question and before i just i, I think yeah i have so, a couple of questions for you as well but just before i ask you those i'm going to ask you this one which i think is is very it's going to be very interesting for people to have an um, idea about so it says um what did you do um, at Warwick on decolonization and what did you learn? And of course, how did you get started? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a fun question. Um, so at Warwick, basically I started out um, in my second year, I was president of the Warwick Anti-Racism Society and the Warwick Anti-Sexism Society. Um, and to be honest, I, I actually remember the day that I like in my mind, I was like, this is the work that I'm doing because uh, we held our, we had our freshers fair like before COVID, like when everything was normal and we had our freshers fair. And I remember it was day four of those students university experiences. And, you know, they were telling me about these experiences of racism that they had. And I was just like, we're on day four, like how, how has this happened already? And so as a committee, like I went back to my exec and as a committee, we were like, right, we're going to do a research report. And so we um, kind of got, got some people together, kept listening, like did basically a listening exercise to hear from black students, from students of color um, about their experiences. And then we literally went straight to our VC um, and were like, these are the things that we want to work on. So um, I think the, the four areas that we're talking about was like the academic disparities that students were facing, um, the mental health experiences they were having and, you know, not having any um, counsellors of colour, feeling like the ways that um, they were expressing their experience with mental health weren't being taken seriously. Um, and then the third area was around like the social experience um, and the ways that like racism was manifesting interpersonally and how that was impacting things like mental health, but also their, their performance and all of these other things. Um, and then the fourth area people continue were talking about was like, why are we so minoritised like in an area? Because Warwick um, is situated in Coventry, which has quite a thriving black community. And it just felt like there was a real problem in terms of access, particularly um, for local black and brown people. And so we had these follow up meetings um, with university managers and like not, not many of the actions were followed up on. And we were just thinking like, we were, talk we were looking at our VC and I remember us talking to each other being like, this guy's not about it. Like, <laughs> so we went again and like, we, we ran a whole campaign called Warwick Speak Out um, and set up this kind of online reporting, reporting tool where people could be completely anonymous. Um, and then, you know, we were just hearing horrible, horrible things that reports of racism from university staff, from lecturers to academic tutors, to residential life tutors, campus security, staff within the immigration department, members of staff in, in outlets, like then also perpetrated by fellow students, like in academic settings, in accommodation, in societies. And then there were things like verbal offenses, like slurs. Um, there was like racist jokes, if people not even call them that like other so much stuff um, and even some quite harrowing physical experiences um, and we put this all together um, and just as, as we finished doing this report I actually became a SAB um, and so I basically took this report on tour um, and, and made just shook the institution basically and was like nah like you, you need to understand what's actually happening here um, and then use that to build the momentum that we needed to set up the work decolonized project um, which actually it, it kind of employs students and, and actually um, remunerates students for doing decol work. Um, and so, we, yeah, we have a setup there where um, students get paid to kind of look at how we decolonize the institution, but not only the curriculum, but all those other areas I was talking about. Um, so, yeah, sorry, that is like my, my backstory um, from um, being a kind of local anti-racist organizer through to being a sab and setting that up. 
Yeah, thank you, Larissa. I think that's really interesting, and it's just it's just very similar. And even here at the Guild, you know, just seeing the lived experiences the students have been through and and how it affects them socially and academically, and just wanting to do something about that. So, thank you very much for that. Um, there's been a couple of questions that have come in, but just out out of interest, you know, when you mentioned um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I, I found that quite interesting as well because you know a lot of universities have only just started addressing um, decolonization for instance, just out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I guess my own question would be, um, how, how can sabbatical officers um, approach, you know, the universities and explain that it's a deep rooted issue and it's not just about ticking the box. So it's just, just so that, you know, they don't come off as, you know, tokenistic in the sense. I think SABs have quite a difficult li like role in terms of uh, telling this line of, um, working, utilizing and negotiating with the institution and using the, the resources that you have as a SAB um, to, to secure those movements towards black liberation, um, but also, you know, being accountable to and working alongside students. And I think something that I wish I'd done more of um, is actually recognizing that your power as a SAB really can come from students at the grassroots. Like if you feel like you're a SAB and, and they, they're continually, like you're saying these things and they're not listening, they, they will listen when there's hundreds of students knocking on their door, like, uh, like uh, obviously digitally in this sense, but like, you know, um, and, and you, you can be a vehicle for like coordinating those things and supporting students to do that work. Um, and I think so often going back to the, the kind of word that was thrown in the chat, anti-hierarchical, like I think if we're thinking about what an anti-hierarchical, um, a truly anti-racist, um, you know, move towards decolonization looks like it's about empowering people to have their say like if the university isn't listening we take it to a point where they're forced to listen because the students upon students upon students are calling for this do you know what i mean i think there's also you know going back to the kind of limitations of, of these universities like what do we want from them um at, and, and let's do that on our terms, because I think the, for me, the key thing is, is about resource. And if they're not if they're not putting their money where their mouth is, then we have to hold them to account. Um, and that's not all on one or two people. And I think often it's like, Sabs, what are you doing to hold them to account? And it's like, you know, I know from experience how hard it is when you're sitting around a room. Um, for, for me, it was always like an all, all white team looking back at me. Um, and I'm there trying to make the case and that is personally emotionally exhausting to have to justify why this needs resource all the time. Like I remember coming out of meetings and just being so tired. Like, why do I have to fight so hard just for you to, to realize that students deserve to be remunerated for doing the work that you should have done decades ago. Like they are literally um, improving this institution beyond their wildest dreams and yet people see it as something that should just be on the side of people's degrees that they're doing anyway they take it for granted um, and so you know obviously depending on, on what you're looking for but I think my, my two pieces of advice would be don't forget that students are your power um, but be very clear on what you actually want and need from the institution and don't don't expend too much energy um, trying to convince people that your life um, and black people's lives and people of color's lives hold worth and um, because it's emotionally exhausting um so though yeah i guess those would be my kind of key pieces of advice oh, but it's, it's hard. amazing it's hard. thank you very much thank, thank you very much um there's there's a question from sean russell um and says if you were to abolish current universities what would a new university look like oh i love this question um i think in in many ways for me um this, this conversation has to be ongoing. Like it has to be like a, it's not like a, I could construct it today because the very point of abolition is about presence rather than absence. So, so building that presence has to come from community, right? It has to be something that we collectively conceptualize um, as what an anti-racist system of knowledge production looks like. Um, but in my head, I'm like, obviously the, the initial thing is the education would be free because once, as soon as you marketize education, as soon as you position students as customers, um, as soon as you act as though education is a kind of something to be bargained with in that way, you completely change um, what the, the kind of systems and structures of education look like. And um, that's never going to be conducive to anti-racism. 
so I guess that's that's kind of the first pillar for me. Um, I think the second thing is around, you know, what does truly accessible education look like? Because you can't have an anti-racist system of education that is exclusionary um, and hierarchical and um, that, you know, forces people to conform to a, a certain way of education. Um, and I think we've so like been forced to buy into this, like, this is what education looks like. Um, and actually looking at like alternative routes to education and um, what, you know, accessible education would look like for um, neurodivergent folks, for um, people who learn in different ways. Um, because at the moment that just does not happen and that conversation is not ha being ha happening adequately. Um, but also recognizing that black and brown forms of knowledge production um, and or historically black and brown forms of knowledge production can and should be much more expansive than what our current education system allows for. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm no by no means an expert in, in all of these different disciplines, but even beginning um, to talk to, you know, some of the ways that we were looking at decolonizing. Um, oh, sorry, what's the name of the department? Uh, um, psycho psychology, psychology, and talking to folks in that discipline um, about you know the ways that people are taught these really immersive forms um, of you know psychological of the psychological discipline in such a like book and pen and paper way, um, and actually thinking about how that would look. Um, if it was led by black and brown folks who actually came up with these forms um, uh, of you know these really immersive forms of, of thought in the first place and like what would it okay forget universities what would it look like if you just wanted to learn seek knowledge and share the learning that you have like it just wouldn't look like one person standing at the front of a lecture hall and potentially hundreds of people just sitting there and listening like we all have things to bring to the table we all have you know our experiential knowledge um and and you know it just wouldn't the, the ways that we um, the ways that we learn really centers the idea that one person can hold and be the arbiter of knowledge, um, as opposed to really decentering that and thinking about the ways that we exchange knowledge between us, which is actually the, for, for me or in my head, the much more decolonial form of looking at this. So I don't know, it feels like I, I didn't particularly answer the question in I think the way that was phrased and, and wanted to be answered. Mm. Um, but I just, I think the, the kind of thing I'm trying to put across is that the possibilities are endless because the way that we do knowledge as we know it today is just so, so inherently problematic. And I think there's so many more ways to exchange knowledge outside of the scope of what we know. Yeah, certainly. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and it's, it's just literally the summary of that question is what does decolonization actually look in practice? Like, if you take out all of the all of the, you know, the downsides, what, what does it look like? Um, and, you know, if you stick around um, to, to throughout the end of the conference, um, throughout the next two days, there's, there's quite a lot of incredible things to be taken out of there. Um, we've got a, a couple more questions coming. And there's another one that says, how can, so this is from Anonymous, how can course reps utilize student staff liaison committee as a space for campaigning for decolonization? And there's a follow-up question that says, do you think decolonization can be achieved from corporate structures like that at university? Well, first off, I love the question because it recognizes that like the way that we do like course reps automatically just corporatizes the idea of um, of student feedback like it shouldn't be like um you give feedback or it should be co-creation right like education should be co-creation mm -hmm. um but we use what we have we use the tools that we have to to have our voices heard and so i absolutely think like do you know what course reps for me are so so important like being a i was education officer at warwick and um seeing the course rep structure and seeing the fact that like these are the people actually on the ground with the roots into their um their actual courses um, and I think there's so much of a role for course reps to play outside of those structures that they sit within. So how could, like, if every single course rep was holding, like, say, town halls where, where students could hold kind of um, course conveners to account for decol work, like, Im just imagine, imagine if across the country, every single course rep that existed, and there's thousands of them, 
literally was like, right, we're going to hold a town hall and we're going to um, hold you to account for how you're using resources to make sure that we're on the road to decolonizing education. Like that would be so powerful. Imagine if every course rep, um, you know, got students together um, to have like a, a reading group or to support people to learn more on their, on their course and learn more about decolonization and then give their opinions about how we start to, to do this within our institutions. Like, I think course reps are literally um, such an untapped resource of our movement. And like, I love, I love chatting to course reps about, you know, how they can start um, to disrupt this idea that they fit within the corporate structures of student feedback and like I don't know it's, it's so it's so exciting to me that we can do that as a movement and have the the opportunity to do that as a movement over the next couple of years um so basically if you're a course rep and you want to do that work let me know drop me a line um and yeah because I'm 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 well I'm well excited about it Thank you very much, Larissa. And I guess another thing to that I'll just add to that is, you know, just equipping the course reps as well, you know, with details on decolonization, because there's some people who are passionate about taking this work forward and they probably don't have like the basics um, in terms of, you know, knowledge and all of that. And I know the NUS is, you know, putting a lot of resources together and that's something that could be very, very helpful for course reps to get involved in. Um, and that this, there's another question. So, there, there are quite a lot of questions, but I really, especially like this one, um, what is a SAB? It keeps coming up and I don't know the abbreviation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Do you want to go, Larissa? Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry. If I'm using any um, any other jargon, let me know in the chat and I'll, <laughs> I'll unpack it. But a SAB is a sabbatical officer is what it's short for. Um, and SABs um, or sabbatical officers um, are elected to represent, work full time to elect, to, elected to work full time to represent students um, at their union. So for example, Toby is a SAV um, yep. for folks at the Guild. Um, or there's like, the, across the country, there's teams of sabbatical officers who are like the executive for their students union. And so are working like um, full-time or in some cases, um, you know, almost full-time or, you know, depending on the union. Um, but yeah, for the most part, full-time to represent students. Um, so yeah, sorry about Yeah, that. sorry, so <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so sabbatical officers take time out of their studies um, to represent you in, at your university, as at the student union, rather. Um, apologies for all the jargons that we've been throwing around, <laughs> uh, but please feel free to pop in the chat if you have any other questions. And we've only got four minutes before um, oh we, we close wow. off, I'm but we still have no. a few questions. Um, so quickly, maybe we can like, you know, go through these questions quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's one here, in your experience when talking to universities, this is from Emma, is it best to focus spe specifically on one of these or, or, or the overarching oppression and the intersections? Wow, I feel like you can't have one of those conversations without having them all, but I don't think that negates understanding the specific um, the specific lens of what's impacting a certain group um, and I say that not to mean just necessarily black students or you know trans students but to say like sometimes there is a specific experiential reality for say black trans students that needs light and that needs space um, to to speak about um, but I think all of these conversations are so interconnected and we talk when we're talking about decolonization as I said we're talking also about decolonizing gender decolonizing sexuality um, you know all of these things um, so I think we can connect them and as organizers we absolutely need to connect them um, but sometimes when we're speaking to the university and we need to get specific resource for certain groups i think there's definitely space um to be talking about for example um the situation of black women or black lgbt folks or you know as, as i say sorry i'm trying to answer really quick now <laughs> yeah. no, no problem and, and, and i'm just going to say you know from a sabbatical officer perspective i think it just just figure out how your university works if your university works at a very slow pace then i think it's very very proper for you to pick your battles figure out you know what what you want to focus on go go ham on that and then take it one step at a time um but but yeah let's move on to the next question um this is from iad sorry i hope i pronounced your name correctly how do you assess your campaign uh what a breakthrough what a big breakthrough you've made in this deeply rooted um colonized system so I think, you know, this idea of uh, sometimes the ways that we frame assessment or 
um, indicators or whatever can be quite a colonial um, framework. Um, and as I was saying, like when we're talking about regular regularizing the moment of dreaming or of building that com commitment, like it's not always something that you can put a tick box against and be like, yes, I like X number of students are now dreaming about decolonization. <laughs> like I do, um, I almost don't know how to quantify it sometimes, and that makes it quite difficult, particularly when we're working within structures that to get resourcing, you often have to like somehow quantify things and it's ridiculous um so i think almost disrupting that idea that it's quantifiable um but in terms of seeing progress i think this is why it's so important to do kind of the work of um archiving because often we see the erasure and invisibilization of this work as years go go on and particularly the the kind of cyclical nature of the student movement means that sometimes we lose this work um so making sure to write stuff down and to archive it um, so that the kind of next set of students are able to start from where you left off as opposed to being pushed back to the beginning of that journey um, is really, really important. Sorry, I'm still trying to answer really fast. Yeah, I know. Um, and and I'm, I'm really sorry, guys, if that was, you know, rushed in any way. There's a question that says, you know, how can we get, um, how can you educate yourself about decolonization in theory and, and practice? And, and I guess um, just, just what we could do is, you know, we have the Discord server up in the chat and then we can like share some resources there. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, and sure. then last question, it's 11 o'clock already. If you guys do not mind, we can take this last question, Larissa, if that's fine by you. Um, I can see how, so this is from Stuart. It says, uh, um, they say, I can see how history, literature, language, ETC can be decolonized. How would decolonization work for science and medicine curricula? Yeah, this is a really Massive interesting question one. for our literal yeah. last minute. But mm. I think that's a really common misconception. Um, and actually, so one of the places that we started with the Warwick Decolonized project, project was the medicine department. Um, and we were looking at, you know, how can we um, unpack the, the fact that there still is um, an attainment gap because of course if if racism wasn't an issue within um, science you just wouldn't see an attainment gap in science subjects which you still do and um, you wouldn't see science students still being subjected to racism which you still do and all of those other things um, so when it comes to um, medicine for example we were talking about you know the fact that many of the instruments that medicine students were learning about were actually tested on black women without anesthetic and they weren't learning about the histories of where those um, instruments came from there's also the side where lots of the ways that um, diseases or um, kind of illness manifest was only shown on white skin. Um, so how do, like people weren't even able to recognize the ways that, you know, certain ailments were showing up on black people and on brown people. Um, and there's so there's just so many other elements. As soon as you start to unpack it, you begin to see how many different problems there are, how much racism manifests within even like science um, you know, and you know, we started to do that work with physics as well. We don't even have the time to get into it, but like, yeah, <laughs> we really did. We were like, concertedly, we're gonna start with science, um, and we're gonna start doing that work because it can happen, it needs to happen. Uh, and black and brown students within um, science departments deserve that we do this work there also. Um, so I'll leave it there, sorry that we don't Yeah, have yeah, de I definitely. Think Thank you, Larissa. Th th I, think, I think that's been very helpful. And, and just to say, um, we have a session on decolonizing uh, evolution and ecology at 3 p.m. So please tune in for that and hopefully you know we can explore and unpack that further. Um, so we are out of time, um, but thank you so much for joining us um, in opening the decolonization and practice conference it's been amazing very very insightful um so to everyone who's uh, watching it as well and listening thank you so much um if you haven't already please uh join um in on the discussion on our discord server this the, the link is somewhere in the chat um and it should or i think it should also be in the same place as you got your zoom links as well but um that will be all from me apologies we've gotten two minutes over um but yeah we'll see you shortly for our next session thank you everybody Thank you. Bye. Bye.